Tonight on Q2, the battle over supposedly offensive books will take center stage. At tonight's school board meeting, we'll flip through the pages and tell you what you need to know. Plus, the owners of a Laurel restaurant are picking up the pieces today after a weekend fire destroyed their inventory. And another weekend, another huge spike of COVID-19 cases will break down the latest numbers as they explode to new heights, not only in Montana, but also here in Yellowstone County. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for starting your week with us. I'm Russ Riesinger. Some big changes are coming to high school basketball in Montana. Last week, the Montana High School Association voted to add a shot clock starting next year. Now, some of Montana's largest school districts are excited about the change, saying it will improve the on-court product. But as MTN's Casey Conlon tells us in tonight's Two Americas report, it'll be a big burden for some of the state's smallest schools. Shouts of excitement rang out across Montana when the MHSA announced a shot clock is officially coming to high school basketball starting next season. But the mood in Class C towns like this one here in Broadview, not nearly as jubilant. In fact, much more concern about the cost this mandatory measure will incur. Now we had another job, um, I'm never going to find them. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Broadview Athletic Director Kim Sorkness DeCock is already worried about having to find another basketball savvy volunteer for next season's games. It's a challenge to find people to keep the book, keep the clock, take tickets. You know, I think it's harder operationally to run a, sh a, a shot clock than it is a game clock. And so, you know, how many stoppages a player they're going to be to try to reset the shot clock. And that's just the human cost. Then there's the cost cost. The basic one we have to have in our gym is going to be around $4,000. Some of the other schools that don't have as updated of uh, clocks as we do will have to buy the whole system. It's going to cost them $20,000. That money will come from most schools' general funds, the money given to them by the state to cover all generic expenses. Supplies, things that we need in the classroom, desks, chairs, those kinds of things. So yes, it's going to take away some of that. So far, Sorkness DeCox says she hasn't heard any additional help coming from the state or MHSA to offset those costs. Even School District 2 Athletic Director Mark Wall, who oversees the largest district in the state, tells Q2, quote, it will be somewhat expensive to install four sets of clocks and that they'll even need to look into sponsorships. It's one of the reasons Scott Severance, Broadview Lavina's varsity boys coach, has been against the shot clock for a while. Yeah, I guess what I've always questioned with it, is this a good use of resources or is there a better way to use them or utilize them to enhance the experience for, for kids and players? I think the intent or the idea behind it is to improve play, but initially at least until there's an adjustment to it, I think the style of play or the quality of play is going to actually go down. Time will tell just how steep the learning curve will be. Casey Conlon, MTN News. The Billing School Board will decide tonight whether to ban two books from the district that depict gay sex from library shelves. One book is Lawn Boy, a novel by Jonathan Evson that describes a sexual encounter between two fourth grade boys. The other book is titled Gender Queer, a memoir, which is a collection of narrative drawings known as a graphic novel. The book contains drawings of two characters having gay sex. Last week, a school board committee recommended to pull Gender Queer from the shelves and to keep Lawn Boy, but the full school board will have the final say on each book at its meeting tonight. The original complaint about the book's content was originally brought up by the father of a West High student, Nathan Matthews, who heard of the content by way of news stories when the books made waves at schools in Texas and Virginia. People in favor of keeping the books say the coming-of-age stories give a voice to the LGBTQ plus students, while those who want to pull them say the content is just too explicit. Trustee Jennifer Hoffman referenced genderqueer at the committee meeting last week. If this book had been written like Lawn Boy in solely text form, I would feel completely different. It is solely the fact that it is in a comic book form with explicit pictures. We would not allow this book if those were straight people. We would not allow the book. Here's a public comment from West High Librarian Aaron Regal, read by District Chief Financial Officer Craig Van Nice. As school librarians, we strive to make sure we have a well-rounded collection that fits the needs of every single one of our students. Gender Queer and Lawn Boy are both award-winning books that give a voice to a group of students that often don't feel that they are represented in our school community. The district's attorney, Jeff Weldon, told the board at that committee meeting that this is the first time in recent memory that books have gone through the content review process. Join us later tonight for a recap of the board's decision. Reporting in Billings, Mitch Laggy, MTN News. 
The COVID-19 virus continues to explode across Montana. The state health officials reported more than 5,000 cases over the weekend. 1,094 of those new cases are confirmed in Yellowstone County alone. There are now nearly 2,700 active cases throughout the county. Montana also saw nine new deaths as the total climbs closer to 3,000. Nearly 300 patients remain in the hospital tonight with 84 of those in the two Billings hospitals. 12 of the 84 are in intensive care and six are on ventilators tonight. And it's been an active afternoon on the weather front. Showers and mountain snow moving through the area. We want to send it over to Chief Meteorologist Ed McIntosh in the Weather Center. What's the latest, Ed? Russ, the blue shaded areas show where we have the biggest concerns for travel problems, anywhere from snow that's going to accumulate to some slick conditions. For our area, we're going to be looking mainly down into the Bighorn Mountains, I-90 heading south. You can see how the snow showers have started to ease up here a bit in the short term. But as we look into the Red Lodge foothills, especially as we start looking into those north-facing slopes, we continue to see some additional snowfall there. Here was the scene earlier in the day from around Red Lodge Mountain where they're reporting up to a couple of inches of snow. That was as of about an hour ago. Well, additional snowfall will likely fall into the evening hours. Got about an inch into town. Closer look at the forecast coming up. As if this year hasn't been hard enough for small businesses, owners at one Laurel restaurant are now facing their own challenge, cleaning up after a fire broke out on the roof of their building. Alina Howder has details. The doors are closed at a popular yogurt shop in Laurel after a fire broke out over the weekend. Though emotions are high, the community support has been overwhelming. The day began just like it always does on Saturday at the yogurt shop in Laurel, but that all changed when an unexpected visitor walked through the door. The police showed up and said we needed to evacuate and they had no idea why. They said we had a fire on our roof. That fire heavily damaged this mom and pop yogurt shop. Jackie Johnson and her family are now picking up the pieces. It's been a very humbling experience, if anything. Flames destroyed the roof and ceiling of the business. Water damage took out the rest. And we're obviously gonna have to replace the roof. We're gonna have to replace the ceiling. Uh, the floor is all water damage, smoke damage, all of our product, our food. Jackie still isn't sure how the fire started, but believes it began upstairs or on the roof. Everything from the cups to utensils will have to be replaced, but that's not what worries Jackie the most. All of our employees are out of work. Obviously, we can't be making money because we can't operate. Though things are tough at the moment, Jackie has been overcome, not with grief, but with gratitude. We've had a lot of people reach out and offer help. One customer stopped by to donate $1,000, others even volunteering to help rebuild. A local contractor, Todd Payne with Payne Construction, has reached out. <sighs> and is offered to help free of charge. Generosity this family will never forget. The one thing about Laurel is you know when you go through something like this, you're not going through it alone. And that's inspired Jackie and her family to rebuild. She's already looking forward to the day that the yogurt shop reopens. And most importantly, to saying thank you. Just come back when we're reopen. <laughs> In Laurel. Tears. <laughs> Alina Howder, MTN News. When testimony continued Monday to determine whether Lloyd Barris was guilty but mentally ill in the 2017 death of Deputy Mason Moore, prosecutors brought in an expert to argue he did have the capacity to understand the criminality of what he did. The witness was Dr. Alan Newman, a consulting psychiatrist from California, brought in to evaluate Barris. State law says a person can be found guilty but mentally ill if they have a condition that means they were unable to, quote, appreciate the criminality of their actions or conform their behavior to the law. Newman agreed with other doctors who diagnosed Barris with a delusional disorder, but he said his extreme delusions were separate from his anti-government attitudes. Barris and his son Marshall refused to pull over when Moore attempted a traffic stop. Prosecutors believe Marshall Barris shot Moore, then the men returned to his vehicle and Marshall fired more than a dozen more times. The two led officers on another chase for nearly 150 miles. Marshall Barris was then killed in a shootout with officers. Newman suggested Lloyd Barris's actions were driven by wanting to avoid capture and keep his son out of jail. In most cases that I've seen, when people flee from law enforcement, they know that the reason they're fleeing from law enforcement is, is that they're going to get caught, captured, and arrested by law enforcement. 
Newman also said Barris later surrendered to police when he could have continued resisting, and he appeared cooperative with officials in the days after, so he showed he could conform in some cases. How is he able to go from going 100 miles an hour to surrendering? Well, the non-psychotic interpretation of that is he's surrendered, it's over. And when somebody surrenders, now they are conforming their conduct and their requirements to the law. But defense attorneys claim Barris's behavior was more likely explained by an acute episode of his mental illness and a years-long paranoia that the government was persecuting him. Last week, the defense presented their own expert, a Montana State Hospital psychiatrist, who said Barris's disorder robbed him of the capacity to understand or conform with the law. Judge Kathy Seeley will have the final determination on whether Barris is eligible for a guilty but mentally ill finding, and that could determine whether he's sent to prison or to the state hospital. But Seeley isn't expected to make an immediate decision. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Still to come on the MTN 530 News here on Q2 as we kick off News Literacy Week. We shine a light on the importance of a news literate society and the dangers associated with misinformation. Then a little later in sports, we'll fly high with a blast from the past and we'll beat the buzzer in this week's top plays from the hardwood. Stay with us. The MTN 530 News continues right after this. From Montana's news leader, you're watching the MTN 530 News. Research suggests we gravitate toward information that reinforces our worldview. But it's important to recognize that sometimes can make us susceptible to misinformation. This week, our parent company, EW Scripps, has once again teamed up with the News Literacy Project to shine a light on better information consumption and sharing. Last year, the average American adult spent about 11 hours a day consuming media on their computers, television, or mobile device. That's a 20% increase from just a decade earlier. We think news literacy is an essential skill in today's fraught information environment. Uh, it's, really, it's really a life skill. And it's Alan Miller is the founder and CEO of the News Literacy Project. He started the nonprofit in 2008 to address concerns about the tsunami of sources of information that vary in credibility and accountability. News literacy is the ability to evaluate all news and information and to discern credible information to be able to sort fact from fiction. A fact is defined as something known to be true. Opinion is a belief or judgment that rests on grounds insufficient to produce complete certainty. The main difference is that facts can be proven, whereas opinions cannot. A 2018 Pew Research study found that when presented with five factual and five statements of opinion, only 26% of adults were able to correctly recognize all five statements of fact. Just 35% were able to identify the statements that were opinions correctly. We've got a perfect storm now that has created a situation where misinformation is an existential threat to the health of our democracy. Miller says one in five newspapers have gone out of business in the last 15 years, while at the same time there's been an explosion of other sources of information. Particularly online and through the social, through social media platforms that do not seek to inform in a fact-based, contextual, accountable way, but rather seek to persuade or exploit or misinform. And he says therein lies the importance of news literacy. I'm Usher Qureshi reporting. As part of National News Literacy Week, MTN invites you to a Facebook Live event stopping the flood of misinformation. From the economy to politics to COVID-19, it can be difficult separating fact from fiction. How can you verify sources? What can you believe on social media? I hope you'll join me and our panel of experts as we help tackle those questions and more this Thursday at 6.30 on the Q2 Facebook page or with the KTVQ streaming app for Roku and other devices. Coming up in weather, today's showers took off that first layer of winter grime. Is it now safe to wash the rest of the car? Ed will let us know right after this. The MTN 530 News continues right after this. Storm Tracker weather starts now with meteorologist Ed McIntosh. Welcome back as we look with the Stockman Bank weather cam to get rolling. 
The current temperature at the airport is sitting at 34 degrees, and it really hasn't varied that much throughout the day. West breeze right now at six miles per hour. The almanac for the day, uh, we're looking at, we, well, I want to talk a little bit about the amount of precipitation. 407 inches what we received so far, if you melt down that little bit of rain and snow that we got. So that puts us pretty close to the seasonal average, and the winds weren't a big deal. Top wind gust was at 27 miles an hour. The coldest temperature so far today at 30 degrees and the warmest 41. One, it's a little bit deceiving because if we take a look and see how that uh, kind of settled in throughout the day, we were hitting that 41 right about midnight. That 42 was taken just before midnight. Temperatures dropped off quickly. So by six in the morning, we had the coldest reading of the day, and then it's been hanging right around that freezing mark. So the precipitation that we have been receiving around the Billings area has been sort of a mix of rain and snow. We got some pretty good sized flakes out of it for a while as well. The chance of showers will persist into this evening. Most of this is going to stay into the mountains and foothills. We talked about at the top of the newscast. We see it down into the big horns and then also into the uh, bear tooths as well. As we start getting into the next 24 hours, those winds will start to increase again. Livingston, Nye, up towards Harlington, Big Timber, you'll see at least wind gusts maybe 50 miles an hour, perhaps 60 closer to the mountains, and some generally pretty dry weather to go along with it. Once we get through this round of showers, now we still have some travel concerns. We're going to be watching those mountain foothills, especially around Red Lodge, and somewhat down into the Bighorns tonight as well, where you can see some additional accumulations. A contrast in temperatures, we've got mainly the 20s and 30s anywhere from Billings all the way over to the western portion of the state, starting to see a bit of clearing up in northwest Montana. But check out the chillier air once we get from around Glendive, Sydney up towards Glasgow, Williston, North Dakota already below zero at minus one. We'll see those temperatures continue to drop a bit more through the overnight hours. So here's how it looks through the evening. The blue shaded areas show where the snow showers continue to impact, especially the north facing slopes of the mountains. That'll be true even into tomorrow morning, perhaps uh, southern Bighorn County. You're going to feel 